Chapter Three of Stories by Foreign Authors, Spanish Authors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Russo. Stories by Foreign Authors, Spanish Authors. The White Butterfly by Jose Selgas, translated by Mary J. Serrano. Part Two. It is true that during these three months of absence, a letter had been received from New York, in which Adrian Baker said to Bertha, all this is said in such cases. It was a simple, tender, and earnest letter that did not seem to have been written three thousand miles away. On the other side of the great ocean, in which the most ardent and the most profound passions are wrecked, it is true that this letter was answered by return of mail and that it traversed the stormy solitudes of the sea full of promises and hopes it is also true that bertha put away adrian baker's letter carefully treasuring it as one treasures a relic it is true that she passed whole hours seated at her piano running her fingers up and down the keys playing adrian baker's favorite airs which he himself had taught her but except this bertha lived like other girls she had an excellent appetite and she slept a tranquil sleep of a happy heart she spent the usual time at her toilet table and she took pleasure in making herself beautiful some of the asperities of her character had become softened she spoke with all her natural vivacity and finally she never mentioned adrian baker's name her father and her nurse observed all this and deduced as a consequence that the traveller had left no trace in bertha's heart only one fear troubled them the fear that he would return in this way another month passed and the memory of adrian baker began to wear away if his name was sometimes mentioned it was as one evokes the memory of a dream the dream however at times assumed the aspect of an impending reality he might return and beyond a doubt he had not intended to remain away forever his last farewell had not been an eternal one if he himself was on the other side of the ocean three thousand miles away that is in new york at the other end of the earth more in the other world his house was there opposite them open kept by his servants with the same luxury and the same pomp as before he had gone away his house that seemed like an enchanted palace waiting for its owner and the order and care with which everything was conducted in it indicated that the servants did not wish to be surprised by the sudden appearance of their master that is to say that adrian baker might return at any moment the plants on the terrace spread their branches as full of life as if they were tended by the hands of Adrian Baker himself. Bertha's father and the housekeeper saw in this house a constant menace. It came to be for them the shadow, so to say, of Adrian Baker. But for all that, time passed and the traveller did not return. Spring came and nature bloomed again with all the riches of vegetation, which she displays in southern climes and it is in the heart of the south that the scene of our story is laid everything put on its fairest and most smiling aspect and the soul felt the vague happiness of a hope that is about to be realized bertha shared in this beautiful awakening of nature and it might be said that her every beauty had acquired a new charm her eyes seemed larger her glance gentler calmer more profound her cheeks fresher softer and rosier and her smile more tender innocent and enchanting her figure had acquired a majestic ease which gave to her movements voluptuousness and firmness it seemed as if youth had made a supreme effort and in giving the last touch to her beauty had obtained a masterpiece she was in the full splendour of her loveliness in exchange adrian baker's palace one morning appeared as gloomy as a sepulchre the drawn blinds and the closed hall door gave it the aspect of a deserted house profound silence reigned within it and yet the palace of adrian baker was still inhabited in the hall the figure of the porter appeared like a shade he was dressed entirely in black and all the other servants of the house were also clad in mourning and in their faces were to be observed signs of sadness what had happened what had happened was simply that adrian baker had died in new york of an acute attack of pneumonia 
the news had spread through the city with the rapidity with which bad news spreads and it had also penetrated into bertha's house at first it seemed incredible that adrian baker should have died as if the life of this man were not subject to the contingencies to which the lives of other mortars are subject but the tidings had been confirmed and they must be believed besides the aspect of the palace bore testimony to the authenticity of the news in that house hung with black the very stones seemed to mourn the news had come in a black bordered letter dated in new york and signed by the head of the house of wilson and company with which adrian baker had large sums deposited bertha's father and the housekeeper looked at each other with amazement and repeated one after the other he is dead he is dead bertha pale as death itself surprised them as they uttered these words and in a sepulchral voice she said yes he has died in new york but he lives in my heart and turning from them she fled to her room and seated herself at the window from which she could see the terrace of the palace the flowers agitated gently by the breezes of spring leaned towards bertha as if sending her a melancholy greeting she gazed at them without a tear in her eyes the extreme pallor of her face and the slight trembling of her lips alone revealed the grief that afflicted her soul suddenly the flight of a white butterfly circling the air attracted her gaze she followed it absently with her eyes and the butterfly as if drawn by bertha's gaze tracing capricious circles left the terrace flew swiftly to bertha's window and entered the room with an involuntary movement bertha extended her hands to catch it but the butterfly darted between them and circled swiftly and silently about her head forming around her brow a sort of aureole which appeared and disappeared like a succession of lightning flashes the wings of the butterfly glowed above bertha's head with a light like the first splendors of the dawn then it passed before her eyes she saw it hovering over the flowers on the terrace and then it disappeared from her gaze as if it had vanished into air her eyes sought it with indescribable eagerness but in vain she saw it no more she clasped her hands and two large tears rose to her eyes and rolled down her cheeks on the following day the housekeeper entering bertha's room saw a shadow outlined against the wall above the head of her bed this shadow as the nurse looked took the form of a human head it was the head of adrian baker the same head with its pale forehead its compelling glance and its smile at once sweet sad and mocking the housekeeper out of her wits with terror crossed herself as she had seen a diabolical vision and hurried out of the room adrian baker's death has wrought terrible ravages in bertha she does not distress those around her by ceaseless sighs and tears she does not continually proclaim in words the depth of her sorrow on the contrary she hides her grief in her own breast devours her tears in secret chokes back her sighs and utters no unavailing complaints adrian baker's name is never heard from her lips it might be thought that she had consoled herself easily if in her eyes there did not lie the shadow of a deep grief if the pallor of her cheeks did not cover her youthful beauty like a funeral pall if her hollow voice did not reveal the profound loneliness of her heart at times she smiles at her father but in her smiles there is an inexpressible bitterness she can be seen fading away like the flame of an expiring lamp like a miser she hides her grief in the bottom of her heart as if she feared that it might be taken from her her father and her nurse see her growing thin they see her fading away they see her dying without being able to stop the ravages of the persistent voiceless inconsolable grief that is slowly sapping her youth and her life and they curse the name of adrian baker and they would at the same time give their lives to bring him back to life but death does not give up its prey and only one hope remains to them the last hope time but time passes and the memory of adrian baker 
like a slow poison, is gradually consuming Berta's life. Everything has been done. She has been surrounded with all the delights of the world. The most eligible suitors have sued for her favour. Youth, beauty, and wealth have disputed her affection with one another. But her grief has remained inaccessible. She has been subjected to every proof, but it has not been possible to tear from her soul the demon image of Adrian Baker. Medical skill has been appealed to, and science has exhausted its resources in vain, for Bertha's malady is incurable. The nurse firmly believes that Adrian Baker has bewitched her, he has diffused through her blood a diabolical filter strong love will survive absence but no love will survive death berta consequently was bewitched her father has only one thought expressed in these words he has gone away and he is taking her with him after all he is taking her with him but there is still one other resource to be appealed to solitude the fields nature who can tell the sky the sun the air of the country may revive her the poetry of nature may awaken in her heart new feelings and new hopes the murmur of the waters the song of the birds the shade of the trees why not there is no human sorrow however great it may be that does not sink into insignificance before the grandeur of the heavens at a little distance from the city bertha's father has a small villa whose white walls and red roof can be seen through the trees which surround it. There could not be a more picturesque situation. To the right, the mountain. To the left, the plain. In front, the sea, stretching far in the distance, until it blends with the horizon. And that nothing may be wanting to complete the picture, the ruins of an ancient monastery, seated on the slope of the mountain, can be seen from the villa. Berta offered no resistance, for it was a matter of indifference to her whether she lived in the city or in the country. The only thing she showed any desire about was that the piano should be taken with them, as if she regarded it as a dear friend and her only confidant, and the family removed to the villa and established themselves in it. Berta herself arranged the room which she was to occupy in the villa. This opened on the garden and served her both as bedroom and dressing-room. Above her bed she hung a beautiful life-size photograph of a head. It was that of Adrian Baker, with his pale, smooth brow, his large blue eyes and his beautiful golden curls. The head of Adrian Baker, admirably photographed, and which she herself had shaded. For the piano no place could be found to please Berta there was only one common room in the villa the parlour which at times also served as a dining-room she was hesitating between the parlour and her bedroom when the idea occurred to her to put it in a small pavilion covered with vines and honeysuckles which stood in a corner of the garden and which was used as a hot-house the idea seemed to be a happy one and she smiled as it occurred to her and the piano was placed in the pavilion like a bird in its cage the journey must have fatigued berta for she retired early to her room where the nurse left her in bed did she sleep we cannot say but at dawn the songs of the birds that made their nest in the garden caused her to rise she opened the window shutters and a flock of birds flew away frightened to hide themselves in the tops of the trees gilded by the first rays of the sun before long however the boldest of them returned to hop before her window looking at berta with a certain audacious familiarity as if they recognized in her an old friend a few grains of wet and a few crumbs of bread scattered on the window still gradually attracted the more timid who grew at last to be familiar the slightest movement indeed caused them to take flight precipitately but they soon recovered their lost confidence and they returned again to hop gaily on the iron railing of the window berta watched them and as she watched them she smiled and at the end of a few days she had induced them to come in and out with perfect confidence in her solitary walks through the garden and through the avenue of lime trees which led to the villa they followed her flying from tree to tree she spent a few hours of the morning every day in the pavilion 
and there the birds came also mingling their joyous carols with the melancholy strains of the piano but the mad gaiety of the birds was powerless to mitigate the profound sadness of berta her one thought was still adrian adrian baker this name which never escaped her lips was to be seen written everywhere by berta's hand on the garden walls on the trunks of the trees and even the vines that covered the pavilion had interlaced their branches in such a manner that adrian baker could be deciphered in them this name was to be met everywhere like the mute echo of an undying memory during the morning hours bertha's countenance seemed to be more animated and her cheeks had even at times a rosy hue but as the day declined her transient animation faded away as if the sun of her life too approached its setting seated at her window she contemplated in silence the clouds illuminated by the last rays of the setting sun juana who had exhausted in vain all her subjects of conversation was with her a sudden brightness hovered over berta's head for an instant circled swiftly around it and then vanished from sight did you see it cried berta yes answered the nurse it was a white butterfly that wanted to set on your head well asked berta white butterflies said the nurse are a sign of good luck they always bring good news yes answered berta pressing her nurse's hand convulsively that is my white butterfly and this time it will not deceive me adrian is coming yes he is coming for me that is what it has come to tell me i was waiting for it the nurse gazed at her for a moment with dilated eyes the setting sun illuminated berta's countenance with a strange light and the poor woman unable to support the look which burned in the eyes of the sick girl bent her head and clasped her hands saying to herself my god she has lost her mind the idea that berta had lost her reason threw the housekeeper into a state of distraction she would hide herself in the remotest corners of the house to cry by herself she could not bear alone the burden of so terrible a secret but to whom could she confide it how stab the father's heart so cruelly to tell him that berta had lost her reason would be to kill him the good man watched over his daughter with the eyes of love but love itself made him blind and he did not perceive her madness and the housekeeper became every day more and more convinced of the reality of this dreadful misfortune during the night she stole many times to the sleeping girl's bedside and listened to her calm breathing no extraordinary change either in her habits or her acts or her words gave evidence of the wandering of her mind true but she was waiting for adrian baker and she declared that he would come it was in vain she tried to persuade her that this was folly for bertha either grew angry and commanded her to be silent or smiled with scornful pity at her arguments was not this madness the housekeeper suddenly lost her appetite and her sleep and she shunned bertha's father for she was not sure of being able to keep the secret which she carried in her bosom the same thought kept revolving in her mind like a mill it seemed as if bertha's madness was going to cost the nurse also her reason one night she lay tossing about unable to sleep her imagination filled with dreadful spectres in the midst of the darkness she saw faces approaching and receding from her that laughed and wept that vanished to appear again and all these faces that danced before her eyes had notwithstanding their grotesque features a diabolical likeness to the head of adrian baker the nurse terrified shut her eyes that she might not see them but notwithstanding she still continued seeing them she thought that she was under the influence of a nightmare and making an effort she sat up in the bed suddenly she heard a distant sound of sweet music a mysterious melody whose notes died away on the breeze she listened attentively and she soon comprehended that the music she heard came from the piano and she sprang out of bed crying berta berta she began to dress herself quickly groping for her things in the darkness saying as she did so in a voice full of anguish 
alone in the pavilion and at this hour child of my heart you are mad all the visions she had seen disappeared she saw nothing she only heard the distant notes of the piano breaking the silence of the night going into the hall she groped her way to bertha's room she gently pushed in the door which opened noiselessly and an indistinct glimmer like the last gleam of twilight met her eyes it was the light of the night lamp burning softly in its porcelain vase her first glance was at the bed which in the indistinct light presented to her eyes only a shapeless object but in a moment more she saw that the bed was empty she thought of taking the lamp that burned in the corner of the room to light her way and going to the pavilion but at this moment she felt a breath of cold damp air blowing softly on her face she turned her eyes in the direction of from which the breeze had come and observed that the window was wide open and that outside all was profound darkness and filled with indescribable amazement unwilling to believe the evidence of her eyes she saw what appeared to be a human figure standing motionless in front of the window its hands clasped and its forehead resting against the window frame a cold perspiration like that of death broke out over her she would have shuddered but she could not she attempted to cry out but her voice died away in her throat she attempted to fly but her feet fastened to the ground refused to carry her with her eyes starting from their sockets her mouth wide open and terror depicted on her countenance she stood as if petrified without the strength to keep erect or the will to fall and in truth she had some reason to be terrified before her stood berta leaning motionless against the window drinking in with rapt attention the notes which at the moment came in a torrent from the piano it was not berta then who was breaking the silence of the night with that mysterious music what unknown hand what invisible hand was it that drew those sounds from the chords of the piano in the midst of the silence and the solitude of the night was what her eyes saw real was what her ears were listening to real or was it all the dreadful hallucination of a terrible dream and this was not all for the memory of the terrified nurse recalls with a secret shudder those mysterious melodies which now enchain her ear yes through the piano roll sounds like the rumbling of thunder and strains are heard now near now far that thrill the heart and tones that fill the soul with terror through the vibrating chords all the spirits of the other world seem to be speaking in an unknown tongue i do not know how long the housekeeper might have stood silent and motionless under the influence of the terror which mastered her if berta had not observed her it caused her neither surprise nor alarm to see her nurse there approaching her she took her by the hand and shaking her gently said do you see do you hear it is adrian adrian who has come for me the white butterfly did not deceive me the housekeeper had by this time recovered herself sufficiently to pass her hand over her forehead and to rub her eyes i knew that he would come continued berta i have been waiting for him every day the nurse as if by a supreme effort drew a deep breath do you hear those sighs that come from the piano said berta it is he he is calling me and since you are here let us go to meet him and taking the lamp in her hand as she spoke she added follow me nurse juana followed her like a ghost they entered the garden and walked toward the pavilion the pale light of the lamp illuminated berta's countenance shedding around it a fantastic light that made the surrounding darkness seem more intense the nurse felt herself drawn along by berta she walked mechanically a power stronger than her terror impelled her in this way they crossed the garden and reached the door of the pavilion there berta stopped and called softly adrian but there was no response to her call 
then they entered the pavilion juana caught hold of berta to keep from falling and closed her eyes the light of the lamp illuminated the pavilion whose solitude seemed startled by this unexpected visit the piano was open and mute no one exclaimed berta sighing no one repeated juana opening her eyes and so it was the pavilion was empty it is beyond a doubt that berta's piano has the marvellous quality of making its strings sound without the intervention of the human hand and this being the case it must be admitted that this marvellous instrument is in addition a consummate musician for it plays with a skill attained only by great artists but since nurse juana cannot conceive how a piano can play of itself without a hand moving the keys she has decided that in this diabolical affair an invisible hand the ghostly hand of some spirit from the other world has intervened this supposition is not altogether admissible for it seems to have been sufficiently proved that spirits do not possess hands but the nurse does not stop for such fine distinctions and she firmly believes that the spirit of adrian baker is wandering about the villa condemned perhaps to eternal torment he takes pleasure in torturing the living even after his death and it is indeed a diabolical amusement for the serenade is repeated nightly the family are aroused from sleep they hasten to the pavilion and the piano becomes silent they enter it and they find no one they have observed that the airs played by berta in the morning are repeated by the piano at night juana is assailed by continual terrors there is no peace in the house berta's father is unable to explain the mystery and his mind is filled with confusion and his heart is a prey to sudden alarms the light of day dissipates the agitation of their minds they fancy themselves the victims of vain hallucinations and arming themselves with heroic valour they make plans for unravelling the awesome mystery the most courageous among them would hide in the pavilion and there await in concealment the hour of the strange occurrence in this way they would discover what fingers drew those sounds from the piano strong in this purpose they awaited the first shades of night but then the courage of the strongest failed the air became filled with fearful shadows the silence with mysterious noises and no one ventured to leave the house they spent the nights in vigil and the terror by which all were possessed made them seem interminable and for berta on the other hand the days were interminable and she awaited the nights with eager impatience one afternoon she expressed a desire to visit the ruins of the monastery and she showed so much eagerness in the matter that there was no resource but to accede to her wish her father and her nurse resolved to accompany her and the three set out the distance between the villa and the monastery was not great but the party walked slowly in the winding path the ruins disappeared suddenly behind a hill as if the earth had swallowed them a few steps further on they suddenly reappeared and the travellers stood before the ruined portico from this point the eye could contemplate the ruined walls the broken partitions the ceilings fallen ill and between the loose stones the solitary flowers of the ruin only the arches which supported the vaulted roof of the chapel had resisted the corroding influence of time the nurse would have now willingly returned to the villa and berta's father had no desire to go any further but berta passed through the ruined portico and they were obliged to follow her she made her way into the chapel passing under the crumbling arches which threatened at every moment to fall down and crush her and she emerged at what must have been the centre of the monastery for the remains of the wall and some broken and unsteady pilasters showed four paths which uniting at their extremities formed a square this must have been the cloister in the middle were vestiges of a choked-up cistern here berta sat down on a piece of cornice which was embedded in the rubbish she seemed pleased in the midst of this desolation 
Her father and the nurse joined her with terror depicted on their countenances. They had heard the noise of footsteps in the chapel. More, Juana had seen a shadow glide away, how or where she did not know, but she was sure that she had seen it. Berta smiled and said, The noise of footsteps and the shadow? Very well. What harm can those footsteps or that shadow do us? They are perhaps the footsteps of Adrian Baker following us. It is his shade that accompanies us. What is there strange in that? Do you not know that I carry him in my heart? Do you not know that I am waiting for him, that I am always waiting for him? At the name of Adrian Baker, Bertha's father and the nurse shuddered. Yes, my child, said the former, but we are far from the villa. The sun is setting. It is growing late. Yes, yes, said Juana. Let us go back. Berta drew her father affectionately toward her and said, Dear father, I am not mad. Juana, I am not mad. Adrian promised me that he would return, and he will return. I am waiting for him. Why should that be madness? I know that I grieve you, and I do not wish to grieve you. I have begged God a thousand times on my knees to tear his image from my heart and his memory from my mind. But God, who sees all things, from whom nothing is hidden, to whom all things are possible, has not wished to do it. Why? He alone knows. The father's eyes filled with tears, and the nurse hid her face in her hands to keep back the sobs that rose in her throat. Berta continued. Yes, it is growing late, but I am very tired. Let us wait a moment. They had nothing to say in answer to her words, nor could they have said anything, for their voices failed them. All three remained silent. Suddenly they looked at one another with indescribable anxiety, for all three had heard a sigh, a human sigh that seemed exhaled by the ruins around them. Could it have been the wind moaning as it swept through the sharp points of the broken walls? Berta rose to her feet and cried twice in a loud voice, Adrian! Adrian! Her voice was borne away on the breeze, losing itself in the distance. But before the last notes died away, another voice resounded among the ruins, saying, Berta! Berta! The sun had just set and the twilight shadows gathered swiftly, as if they had sprung up from among the ruins, hiding the broken pillars and the crumbling walls. In one of the angles of the cloister appeared a moving shadow. This shadow advanced slowly until it reached the middle of the court where the remains of the disused cistern were seen. There it stopped, and in a soft, clear voice uttered the words, It is I, Berta, it is I. He, she cried, extending her arms in the air. Juana uttered a cry of terror and caught hold of Bertha with all the strength left her. The father tried to rise, but unable to sustain himself, fell on his knees beside his daughter. It was not possible to reject the evidence of their senses. Whatever might be the hidden cause of the marvel, the dark key of the mystery, the shadow which had just appeared in the angle of the cloister was clearly the authentic image, the vera effigies, the very person of Adrian Baker. The astonished eyes of Bertha, of her father, and of the nurse could not refuse to believe it. His fair curls, his pale brow, the outlines of his figure, his air, his glance, his voice, all were there before the amazed eyes of Bertha, her father, and the nurse. Now, was this a fantastic creation of their troubled senses? Was it a phantom of the brain or a reality? Did all three suffer at the same time the same hallucination? The fixed thought of all three was Adrian Baker, and the senses often counterfeit the reality of our vain imaginings. The state of their minds, the place, the hour, and then the air produces sounds that deceive the light and the darkness mingling together in the mysterious hour of twilight people the solitude with strange visions, and in the midst of those ruins which began to assume fantastic forms, and which seemed to move in the gathering shades of twilight, 
Berta, her father, and the nurse might well believe themselves in the presence of a spectre evoked there by their presence. But the fact was that the shadow, instead of vanishing, instead of changing its shape, as happens with chimeras of the brain, assumed before their eyes a more distinct form, more defined outlines, according as he approached the group. Reaching them, he took gently in his the hands of Bertha held out to him. His eyes shone with the light of a supreme triumph. It is I, he said in a moved voice. I, Adrian Baker, I am not a spectre risen from the tomb. Bertha felt herself growing faint and was obliged to sit down. And Adrian Baker continued thus. Forgive me. I have put your heart to a terrible proof but the doubts of my soul were still more terrible. The world had filled my spirit with horrible distrust, and I desired to sound the uttermost depths of your love. It has resisted absence, and it has resisted death. Your love for me was not a passing fancy. You did not deceive yourself when you vowed me an eternal love. I left you in order to watch you, and I died to comprehend you. I have followed you everywhere. I have not separated from you a single moment. My sweet Berta, you waited for me living, and you have waited for me dead. If you wait for me, I said, your own heart will announce my return to you. And you see, I have returned. I felt for you an immense tenderness, but a terrible doubt consumed my heart. Had my riches dazzled you? Forgive me, Berta. A fatal learning had frozen faith in my soul. I doubted everything, and I doubted your heart also. I doubted you. Berta clasped her hands, and raising her eyes to heaven, exclaimed mournfully, My God, what cruel injustice! Yes, burst out Adrian Baker, cruel injustice. But you have resuscitated my heart. You have brought my soul back to life. Ah! said Bertha, laying her hands on his breast. What if it were too late? Then, turning to her father and the nurse, she said, I feel very cold. Let us return to the villa. And leaning on Adrian Baker's arm, she led the way. Her father and the nurse followed her in silence. The good man had comprehended everything, but the poor woman comprehended nothing. What passed that night in the villa, it is not necessary to relate. It was a night of pain, of agitation, and of anguish. It was necessary to go to the city for a physician. Why? Because Berta was dying. Adrian Baker was the image of despair. The unhappy father wept as if his heart would break, and the nurse stole away from time to time to cry unable to restrain her tears. At dawn it was necessary to go again to the city, for the physician of the body had exhausted the resources of science, and they were obliged to have recourse to the physician of the soul. Dawn was just breaking when a priest alighted at the door of the villa. The sick girl received him, if we may be allowed the expression, with melancholy gladness, and a little later all was over. In the middle of the room, on a funeral bier, lighted by six large wax tapers, which cast a melancholy light around, lay the body of the dead girl. The window admitted the morning light, and the autumn wind, tearing the dead leaves from the trees in the garden, scattered them over the inanimate form of Berta, as if death thus rendered homage to death. Attracted by the light of the torches, a white butterfly flew silently in and circled around and around the head of the dead girl, watching the body, where the father, leaning over the bier, bowed down under the weight of an immeasurable grief. The nurse dissolved in tears. Adrian, with dry and glittering eyes, pale, motionless, mute, terrible in his anguish, and the priest with folded arms and head bent over his breast, murmuring pious prayers. Such was the scene which the morning sun lighted in Berta's room. 
the birds of the garden alighted on the rail of the window but did not venture to enter they looked in apprehensively and flew away terrified they twittered on the branches of the trees, and their melancholy chirpings seemed like sighs. Breathing a sigh torn from the inmost depths of his soul, Adrian Baker exclaimed in a hollow voice, Miserable man that I am! I have killed her! Ah, yes, said the priest, slowly shaking his head. Divine justice! Doubt kills! End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Stories by Foreign Authors, Spanish Authors」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Senna Stories by Foreign Authors Spanish Authors Chapter 4 Maese Perez, The Organist By Gustavo Adolfo Becker From Modern Ghosts Translated by Rollo Ogden Maese Perez, The Organist Section 1 Do you see that man? With the scarlet cloak and the white plume in his hat and the gold embroidered vest? I mean the one just getting out of his litter. I'm going to greet that lady, the one coming along after those four pages who are carrying torches. Well, that is the Marquis of Mascoso, lover of the widow, the Countess of Via Pineda. They say that before he began paying court to her, he had sought the hand of a very wealthy man's daughter. But the girl's father, who they say is a trifle close-fisted, but hush, speaking of the devil, do you see that man closely wrapped in his cloak coming on foot under the arch of San Felipe? While well, he is the father in question, everybody in Seville knows him on account of his immense fortune. Look, look at that group of stately men. They are the twenty-four knights. Aha, there's that hemming, too. They say that the gentlemen of the Green Cross have not challenged him yet, thanks to his influence with the great ones at Madrid. All he comes to church for is to hear the music. Alas, neighbor, that looks bad. I fear there's going to be a scuffle. I shall take refuge in the church, for according to my guess, there will be more blows than paternosters. Look, look, the Duke of Alcala's people are coming round the corner of St. Peter's Square, and I think I see the Duke of Medina Sidonia's men in Duenas Alley. Didn't I tell you? There, there, the blows are beginning. Neighbor, neighbor, this way before they close the doors. But what's that? They've left off. What's that light? Torches? A litter? It's the bishop himself. God preserve him in his office as many centuries as I desire to live myself. If it were not for him, half Seville would have been burned up by this time with these quarrels of the dukes. Look at them. Look at them, the hypocrites. How they both press forward to kiss the bishop's ring. But come, neighbor. Come into the church before it is packed full. Some nights like this, it is so crowded that you could not get in if you were no larger than a grain of wheat. The nuns have a prize in their organist. Other sisterhoods have made Maese Perez magnificent offers. Nothing strange about that, though, for the archbishop has offered him mountains of gold if he would go to the cathedral. But he would not listen to them. He would sooner die than give up his beloved organ. You don't know Maese Perez? Oh, I forgot you had just come to the neighborhood. Well, he is a holy man, poor to be sure, but as charitable as any man that ever lived. With no relative but a daughter, and no friend but his organ, he spends all his time in caring for the one and repairing the other. The organ is an old affair, you must know, but that makes no difference to him. He handles it so that its tone is a wonder. How he does know it! And all by touch, too. For did I tell you that the poor man was born blind? Humble, too, as the very stones. He always says that he is only a poor convent organist, when the fact is he could give lessons in solfa 
to the very chapel master of the primate. You see, he began before he had teeth. His father had the same position before him, and as the boy showed such talent, it was very natural that he should succeed his father when the latter died. And what a touch he has, God bless him. He always plays well, always. But on a night like this, he is wonderful. He has the greatest devotion to this Christmas Eve Mass. And when the host is elevated, precisely at twelve o'clock, which is the time that our Lord came into the world, his organ sounds like the voices of angels. But why need I try to tell you about what you are going to hear tonight? It is enough for you to see that all the elegance of Seville, the very archbishop included, comes to a humble convent to listen to him. And it is not only the learned people who can understand his skill that come. The common people, too, swarm to the church and are still as the dead when Maese Perez puts his hand to the organ. And when the host is elevated, when the host is elevated, then you can't hear a fly. Great tears fall from every eye, and when the music is over, a long-drawn sigh is heard, showing how the people have been holding their breath all through. But come, come, the bells have stopped ringing, and the mass is going to begin. Hurry in. This is Christmas Eve for everybody. But for no one is it a greater occasion than for us. So saying, the good woman, who had been acting as Cicerone for her neighbor, pressed through the portico of the convent of Santa Inez, and elbowing this one and pushing the other, succeeded in getting inside the church, forcing her way through the multitude that was crowding about the door. Section 2. The church was profusely lighted. The flood of light which fell from the altars glanced from the rich jewels of the great ladies, who, kneeling upon velvet cushions placed before them by pages, and taking their prayer books from the hands of female attendants, formed a brilliant circle around the chancel lattice. Standing next that lattice, wrapped in their richly colored and embroidered cloaks, letting their green and red orders be seen with studied carelessness, holding in one hand their hats, the plumes sweeping the floor, and letting the other rest upon the polished hilts of rapiers, or the jeweled handles of daggers. The twenty-four knights, and a large part of the highest nobility of Seville, seem to be forming a wall for the purpose of keeping their wives and daughters from contact with the populace. The latter, swaying back and forth at the rear of the nave, with a noise like that of a rising surf, broke out into joyous acclamations as the archbishop was seen to come in. That dignitary seated himself near the high altar under a scarlet canopy, surrounded by his attendants, and three times blessed the people. It was time for the mass to begin. Nevertheless, several minutes passed before the celebrant appeared. The multitude commenced to murmur impatiently. The knights exchanged words with each other in a low tone, and the archbishop sent one of his attendants to the sacristan to inquire why the ceremony did not begin. Maese Perez has fallen sick, very sick, and it will be impossible for him to come to the midnight mass. This was the word brought back by the attendant. The news ran instantly through the crowd. The disturbance caused by it was so great that the chief judge rose to his feet, and the officers came into the church to enforce silence. Just then, a man of unpleasant face, thin, bony, and cross-eyed too, pushed up to the place where the archbishop was sitting. My Perez is sick, he said. The ceremony cannot begin. If you see fit, I will play the organ in his absence. My Perez is not the best organist in the world, nor need this instrument be left unused after his death, for lack of anyone able to play it. The archbishop nodded his head in assent, although some of the faithful, who had already recognized in that strange person an envious rival of the organist of Santa Inez, were breaking out in cries of displeasure. Suddenly, a surprising noise was heard in the portico. My Perez is here! My Perez is here! At this shout, coming from those jammed in by the door, everyone looked around. Maese Perez, 
pale and feeble, was in fact entering the church, brought in a chair which all were quarrelling for the honour of carrying upon their shoulders. The commands of the physicians, the tears of his daughter, nothing had been able to keep him in bed. No, he had said, this is the last one, I know it, I know it, and I do not want to die without visiting my organ again, this night above all, this Christmas Eve. Come, I desire it, I order it, come, to the church. His desire had been gratified. The people carried him in their arms to the organ loft. The mass began. Twelve struck on the cathedral clock. The introit came, then the gospel, then the offertory, and the moment arrived when the priest, after consecrating the sacred wafer, took it in his hands and began to elevate it. A cloud of incense filled the church in bluish undulations. The little bells rang out in vibrating peals, and Maise Perez placed his aged fingers upon the organ keys. The multitudinous voices of the metal tubes gave forth a prolonged and majestic chord, which died away little by little, as if a gentle breeze had borne away its last echoes. To this opening burst, which seemed like a voice lifted up to heaven from earth, responded a sweet and distant note, which went on swelling and swelling in volume until it became a torrent of overpowering harmony. It was the voice of the angels, traversing space and reaching the world. Then distant hymns began to be heard, intoned by the hierarchies of seraphim. A thousand hymns at once, mingling to form a single one, though this was only an accompaniment to a strange melody which seemed to float above that ocean of mysterious echoes as a strip of fog above the waves of the sea. One song after another died away. The movement grew simpler. Now only two voices were heard, whose echoes blended. Then but one remained, and alone sustained a note as brilliant as a thread of light. The priest bowed his face, and above his gray head appeared the host. At that moment, the note which Maise Perez was holding began to swell and swell, and an explosion of unspeakable joy filled the church. From each of the notes forming that magnificent chord, a theme was developed, and some near, others far away. These brilliant, those muffled, one would have said that the water and the birds, the breezes and the forests, men and angels, earth and heaven were singing, each in its own language, a hymn in praise of the Savior's birth. The people listened, amazed and breathless. The officiating priest felt his hands trembling, for it seemed as if he had seen the heavens opened and the host transfigured. The organ kept on, but its voice sank away gradually, like a tone going from echo to echo and dying as it goes. Suddenly, a cry was heard in the organ loft, a piercing, shrill cry, the cry of a woman. The organ gave a strange, discordant sound, like a sob, and then was silent. The multitude flocked to the stairs leading up to the organ loft, towards which the anxious gaze of the faithful was turned. What has happened? What is the matter? one asked the other. And no one knew what to reply. The confusion increased. The excitement threatened to disturb the good order and decorum fitting within a church. What was that? asked the great ladies of the chief judge. He had been one of the first to ascend to the organ loft. Now, pale and displaying signs of deep grief, he was going to the archbishop, who was anxious, like everybody else, to know the cause of the disturbance. What's the matter? My Perez has just expired. In fact, when the first of the faithful rushed up the stairway and reached the organ loft, they saw the poor organist fallen face down upon the keys of his old instrument, which was still vibrating, while his daughter, kneeling at his feet, was vainly calling to him with tears and sobs. Section 3 Good evening, my dear Doña Baltasara. Are you also going tonight to the Christmas Eve Mass? For my part, I was intending to go to the parish church to hear it. But what has happened? Where is Vicente going, do you ask? 
why, where the crowd goes. And I must say, to tell the truth, that ever since my Cepeda's died, it seems as if a marble slab was on my heart whenever I go to Santa Ines. Poor dear man. He was a saint. I know one thing. I keep a piece of his cloak as a relic, and he deserves it. I solemnly believe that if the archbishop would stir in the matter, our grandchildren would see his image among the saints on the altars. But of course, he won't do that. The dead and absent have no friends, as they say. It's all the latest thing nowadays. You understand me. What? You do not know what has happened? Well, it's true that you are not exactly in our situation. From our house to the church, and from the church to our house, a word here and another one there, on the wing, without any curiosity whatever, I easily find out all the news. Well then, it's a settled thing that the organist of San Roman, that squint eye who is always slandering other organists, that great blunderer, who seems more like a butcher than a master of solfa, is going to play this Christmas Eve in Maese Perez's old place. Of course, you know, for everybody knows it, and it is a public matter in all Seville that no one dared to try it. His daughter would not, though she is a professor of music herself. After her father's death, she went into the convent as a novice. Her unwillingness to play was the most natural thing in the world. Accustomed as she was to those marvelous performances, any other playing must have appeared bad to her, not to speak of her desire to avoid comparisons. But when the sisterhood had already decided that in honor of the dead organist, and as a token of respect to his memory, the organ should not be played tonight, here comes this fellow along and says that he is ready to play it. Ignorance is the boldest of all things. It is true. The fault is not his so much as theirs who have consented to this profanation. But that is the way of the world. But, I say, there's no small bit of people coming. Anyone would say that nothing had changed since last year. The same distinguished persons, the same elegant costumes, the crowning at the door, the same excitement in the portico, the same throng in the church. Alas, if the dead man were to rise, he would feel like dying again to hear his organ played by inferior hands. The fact is, if what the people of the neighborhood tell me is true, they are getting a fine reception ready for the intruder. When the time comes for him to touch the keys, there is going to break out a racket made by timbrels, drums, and horse fiddles so that you can't hear anything else. But hush! There's the hero of the occasion going into the church. Goodness! What gaudy clothes, what a neckcloth, what a high and mighty air. Come, hurry up. The archbishop came only a moment ago, and the mass is going to begin. Come on. I guess this night will give us something to talk about for many a day. Saying this, the worthy woman, whom the reader recognizes by her abrupt talkativeness, went into the church of Santa Inez, opening for herself a path in her usual way by shoving and elbowing through the crowd. The ceremony had already begun. The church was as brilliant as the year before. The new organist, after passing between the rows of the faithful and the nave, and going to kiss the archbishop's ring, had gone up to the organ loft, where he was trying one stop of the organ after another, with an affected and ridiculous gravity. A low, confused noise was heard coming from the common people, clustered at the rear of the church a sure augury of the coming storm, which would not be long in breaking. He is a mere clown, said some, who does not know how to do anything, not even look straight. He is an ignoramus, said others, who after having made a perfect rattle out of the organ in his own church, comes here to profane Maese Perezes. And while one was taking off his cloak so as to be ready to beat his drum to good advantage, and another was testing his timbrel, and all were more and more buzzing out in talk, only here and there could one be found to defend even that curious person, whose proud and pedantic bearing so strongly contrasted with the modest appearance and kind affability of Maese Perez. At last, the looked-for moment arrived when the priest, after bowing low and murmuring the sacred words, took the host in his hands. 
the bells gave forth a peal, like a rain of crystal notes. The transparent waves of incense rose, and the organ sounded. But its first chord was drowned by a horrible clamor, which filled the whole church. Bagpipes, horns, timbrels, drums, every instrument known to the populace, lifted up their discordant voices all at once. The confusion and clangor lasted but a few seconds. As the noises began, so they ended, all together. The second chord, full, bold, magnificent, sustained itself, pouring from the organ's metal tubes like a cascade of inexhaustible and sonorous harmony. Celestial songs, like those that caress the ear in moments of ecstasy. Songs which the soul perceives, but which the lip cannot repeat. Single notes of a distant melody, which sound at intervals, borne on the breeze, the rustle of leaves kissing each other on the trees with a murmur like rain, trills of larks which rise with quivering songs from among the flowers like a flight of arrows to the sky, nameless sounds overwhelming as the roar of a tempest, fluttering hymns which seem to be mounting to the throne of the Lord like a mixture of light and sound, all were expressed by the organ's hundred voices, with more vigor, more subtle poetry, more weird coloring than had ever been known before. When the organist came down from the loft, the crowd which pressed up to the stairway was so great, and their eagerness to see and greet him so intense, that the chief judge, fearing, and not without reason, that he would be suffocated among them all, ordered some of the officers to open a path for the organist, with their staves of office, so that he could reach the high altar where the prelate was waiting for him. You perceive, said the archbishop, that I have come all the way from my palace to hear you. Now are you going to be as cruel as my Cepedes? He would never save me the journey by going to play the Christmas Eve Mass in the cathedral. Next year, replied the organist, I promise to give you the pleasure, since for all the gold in the world, I would never play this organ again. But why not? interrupted the prelate. Because, returned the organist, endeavoring to repress the agitation which revealed itself in the pallor of his face, because it is so old and poor, one cannot express oneself on it satisfactorily. The archbishop withdrew, followed by his attendants. One after another, the litters of the great folk disappeared in the windings of the neighboring streets. The group in the portico scattered, the sexton was locking up the doors, when two women were perceived, who had stopped to cross themselves and mutter a prayer, and who were now going on their way into Duenas Alley. "'What would you have, my dear Doña Baltasara? one was saying. "'That's the way I am. Every crazy person with his whim. The barefooted capuchins might assure me that it was so, and I would not believe it. That man never played what we have heard. Why, I have heard him a thousand times.' and San Bartolome, his parish church. The priest had to send him away. He was so poor a player. You felt like plugging your ears with cotton. Why, all you need is to look at his face, and that is the mirror of the soul, they say. I remember as if I was seeing him now, poor man. I remember Maise Perez's face, nights like this, when he came down from the organ loft, after having entranced the audience with his splendors. What a gracious smile. What a happy glow on his face. Old as he was, he seemed like an angel. But this creature came plunging down as if a dog were barking at him on the landing, and all the color of a dead man, while his, Come, dear Doña Bantasara, believe me and believe what I say. There is some great mystery about this. Thus conversing, the two women turned the corner of the alley and disappeared. There is no need of saying who one of them was. Section 4 Another year had gone by. The abbess of the convent of Santa Inez and Maise Perez's daughter were talking in a low voice, half hidden in the shadows of the church choir. The penetrating voice of the bell was summoning the faithful. A very few people were passing through the portico, silent and deserted this year, and after taking holy water at the door, or choosing seats in a corner of the nave, where a handful of residents of the neighborhood 
were quietly waiting for the Christmas Eve Mass to begin. There, you see, the Mother Superior was saying, your fear is entirely childish. There is no one in the church. All Seville is trooping to the cathedral tonight. Play the organ and do it without any distrust whatever. We are only a sisterhood here. But why don't you speak? What has happened? What is the matter with you? I am afraid, replied the girl, in a tone of the deepest agitation. Afraid? Of what? I do not know. Something supernatural. Listen to what happened last night. I had heard you say that you were anxious for me to play the organ for the mass. I was proud of the honor, and I thought I would arrange the stops and get the organ in good tune so as to give you a surprise today. Alone, I went into the choir and opened the door leading to the organ loft. The cathedral clock was striking just then. I do not know what hour, but the strokes of the bell were very mournful, and they were very numerous, going on sounding for a century, as it seemed to me, while I stood as if nailed to the threshold. The church was empty and dark. Far away, there gleamed a feeble light, like a faint star in the sky. It was the lamp burning on the high altar. By its flickering light, which only helped to make the deep horror of the shadows the more intense, I saw, I saw, Mother, do not disbelieve it, a man, in perfect silence, and with his back turned towards me, he was running over the organ keys with one hand while managing the stops with the other. And the organ sounded, but in an indescribable manner. It seemed as if each note were a sob, smothered in the metal tube, which vibrated under the pressure of the air compressed within it, and gave forth a low, almost imperceptible tone, yet exact and true. The cathedral clock kept on striking, and that man kept on running over the keys. I could hear his very breathing. Fright had frozen the blood in my veins. My body was as cold as ice, except my head, and that was burning. I tried to cry out, but I could not. That man turned his face and looked at me. No, he did not look at me, for he was blind. It was my father. Nonsense, sister. Banish these fancies with which the adversary endeavors to overturn weak imaginations. Address a paternoster and an Ave Maria to the Archangel St. Michael, the captain of the celestial hosts, that he may aid you in opposing evil spirits. Wear on your neck a scapulary, which has been pressed to the relics of St. Pacomio, the counselor against temptations, and go, go quickly and sit at the organ. The Mass is going to begin, and the faithful are growing impatient. Your father is in heaven, and thence, instead of giving you a fright, will descend to inspire his daughter in the solemn service. The prioress went to occupy her seat in the choir in the midst of the sisterhood. Maisa Perez's daughter opened the door of the organ loft with trembling hand, sat down at the organ, and the mass began. The mass began and went on without anything unusual happening until the time of consecration came. Then the organ sounded. At the same time came a scream from Maisa Perez's daughter. The mother superior, the nuns, and some of the faithful rushed up to the organ loft. Look at him! Look at him! cried the girl, fixing her eyes, starting from their sockets, upon the seat from which she had risen in terror. She was clinging with convulsed hands to the railing of the organ loft. Everybody looked intently at the spot to which she directed her gaze. No one was at the organ, yet it went on sounding, sounding like the songs of the archangels in their bursts of mystic ecstasy. Didn't I tell you a thousand times, if I did once, dear Doña Baldassara, didn't I tell you there is some great mystery about this? What? Didn't you go last night to the Christmas Eve Mass? Well, you must know anyhow what happened. Nothing else is talked about in the whole city. The Archbishop is furious, and no wonder. Not to have gone to Santa Inez, not to have been present at the miracle, and all to hear a wretched clatter? That's all the inspired organist of San Bartolome made in the cathedral, so persons who heard him tell me. Yes, I said so all the time. The squinti never could have played that. It was all a lie. There's some great mystery here. What do I think it was? Why, it was the soul. 
of my sip it is. End of chapter 4 Recording by Senna Chapter 5 of Stories by Foreign Authors Spanish Authors This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Arusu. Stories by Foreign Authors Spanish Authors Chapter 6 Moors and Christians by Pedro Antonio de Alarcón From Moors and Christians Translated by Mary J. Serrano Part 1. The once famous but now little-known town of Aldeir is situated in the Marquisate of El Senet, or let us say on the eastern slope of the Alpujara, and partly hangs over a ledge, partly hides itself in a ravine of the giant central ridge of Sierra Nevada, five or six thousand feet above the level of the sea, and seven or eight thousand below the eternal snows of the Mulhacem. Aldeir, be it said with all respect to its reverend pastor, is a Moorish town. That it was formerly Moorish is clearly proved by its name, its situation, and its architecture. And that it is not yet completely Christianized, although it figures among the towns of reconquered Spain, and has its little Catholic church, and its confraternities of the Virgin, of Jesus, and of several of the saints, is proved by the character and the customs of its inhabitants, by the perpetual feuds, as terrible as they are causeless, which unite or separate them, and by the gloomy black eyes, pale complexions, laconic speech, and infrequent laughter of men, women, and children but it may be well to remind our readers in order that neither the aforesaid pastor nor any one else may question the justice of this reasoning that the moors of the marquisate of el senet were not expelled in a body like those of the alpujara but that many of them succeeded in remaining in the country living in concealment thanks to the prudence or the cowardice which made them turn a deaf ear to the rash and the heroic appeal of their unfortunate prince aben humsia whence i infer that uncle juan gomez nicknamed hormiga the ant in the year of grace eighteen twenty one constitutional alcalde of aldeir might very well be the descendant of some mustafa mohammed or the like it is related then that the aforesaid juan gomez a man at the time of our story about fifty years of age very shrewd although he knew neither how to read nor write and grasping and industrious to some purpose as might be inferred not only from his sobriquet but also from his wealth acquired honestly or otherwise and invested in the most fertile lands of the district leased at a nominal rent by means of a present to the secretary of the corporation of some hands which he had left off laying a piece of arid town land on which stood an old ruin formerly a moorish watch-tower or hermitage and still called the moor's tower needless to say that uncle hormiga did not stop to consider for an instant who this moor might be nor what might have been the original purpose of the ruined building the one thing which he saw at once clear as water was that with the stones which had already fallen from the ruin and those which he should remove from it he might make a secure and commodious yard for his cattle consequently on the very day after it came into his possession and as a suitable pastime for a man of his thrifty habits he began to devote his leisure hours to the task of pulling down what still remained standing of the ruin you will kill yourself said his wife seeing him come home in the evening covered with dust and sweat and carrying his crowbar hidden under his cloak on the contrary he answered this exercise is good for me it will put my blood in motion and keep me from being like our sons the students who according to what the storekeeper tells me were at the theatre in granada the other night looking so yellow that it was enough to make one sick to see them poor boys from studying so much but you ought to be ashamed to work like a labourer when you are the richest man in the town and alcalde into the bargain that is why i take no one with me here 
hand me the salad it would be well to have someone to help you however you will spend an age pulling down the tower by yourself and besides you may not be able to manage it don't talk nonsense torquata when i begin to build the wall of the cattle yard i shall hire workmen and even employ a master builder but any one can pull down and it is such fun to destroy come clear away the table and let us go to bed you speak that way because you are a man as for me it disturbs and saddens me to see things destroyed old women's notions if you only knew how many things there are in the world that ought to be destroyed hold your tongue you freemason it was a misfortune they ever elected you alcalde you will see when the royalists come into power again that the king will have you hanged yes we shall see bigot hypocrite owl come i am sleepy stop blessing yourself and put out that light and thus they would argue until one or the other of the concerts fell asleep one evening uncle holmiga returned from his work every thoughtful and preoccupied and earlier than usual his wife waited until after he had dismissed the labourers to ask him what was the matter when he responded by showing her a leaden tube with a cover somewhat like the tube in which a soldier on furlough keeps his leave from which he drew a yellow parchment covered with crabbed handwriting and carefully unrolling it said with imposing gravity i don't know how to read even in spanish which is the easiest language in the world but the devil take me if this was not written by a moor that is to say that you found it in the tower i don't say it on that account alone but because these spiders legs don't look like anything i ever saw written by a christian the wife of juan gomez looked at the parchment smelled it and exclaimed with a confidence as amusing as it was ill-founded by a moor it was written after a while she added with a melancholy air although i am but a poor hand myself at reading writing i would swear that we hold in our hands the discharge of some soldier of mohammed who is now in the bottomless pit you say that on account of the tube on account of the tube i say it well then you are altogether wrong my dear torquata for such a thing as conscription was not known among the moors nor is this a discharge this is a uh, a uh, uncle hormiga glanced around him cautiously lowered his voice and said with an air of absolute certainty this paper contains directions where to find a treasure you are right cried his wife suddenly inspired with the same belief and have you already found it is it very big did you cover it up carefully again are the coins gold or silver do you think they will pass current now what a happiness for our boys how they will spend money and enjoy themselves in granada and madrid i want to have a look at it let us go there there is a moon to-night silly woman be quiet how do you suppose that i could find the treasure by these directions when i don't know how to read either in moorish or in christian that's true well then i'll tell you what to do as soon as it is daylight saddle a good mule cross the sierra through the puerto de la laguna which they say is safe now and go to jihar to the house of our gossip don matias quesada who knows something of everything he will explain what is in the paper and give you good advice as he always does and money enough his advice has cost me notwithstanding our gossip red but i was thinking of doing that myself in the morning i will start for ujihar and be back by nightfall i can do that easily by putting the mule to his speed but be sure and explain everything to him clearly i have very little to explain the tube was hidden in a hollow or niche in the wall and covered with tiles like those at valencia i tore down the whole of the wall but i found nothing else at the surface of the ground begin the foundation walls built of immense stones more than a yard square any one of which it would take two or three men as strong as i am to move consequently it is necessary to know exactly where the treasure is hidden unless we want to tear up all the foundation walls of the tower which could not be done without outside help no no set out for ujihar as soon as it is daybreak offer our gossip a part not a large one of what we may find and as soon as we know where we must dig i will help you myself to tear up the foundation stones 
my darling boys it is all for them for my part the only thing that troubles me is lest there be some sin in the business that we are whispering about what sin can there be in it you great fool i can't explain what i mean but treasures have always seemed to me to have something to do with the devil or the fairies and then you got that ground for so low a rent the whole town says there was some trickery in the business that concerns the secretary and councillors they drew up the documents besides as i understand when a treasure is discovered a part of it must be given to the king that is when it is found on ground that it's not one's own like mine one's own one's own who knows to whom the tower the council sold you belonged why to the moor of course and who knows who that moor may have been it seems to me juan whatever money the moor may have hidden in his house should belong to him or to his heirs not to you or to me you are talking nonsense according to that it is not i who ought to be the alcalde of aldeir but the man who was alcalde a year ago at the time of the proclamation of riego according to that we should have to send the rents of the lands of granada and guadix and hundreds of other towns every year to the descendants of the moors in africa it may be that you are right at any rate go to ujihar and our gossip will tell you what is best to be done in the matter ujihar is distant from aldeir some four leagues and the road between the two towns is a very bad one before nine o'clock on the following morning however uncle juan gomez wearing his blue stockinet knee breeches and his embroidered white sunday boots was in the office of don matias de quesada a vigorous old man a doctor in civil and criminal jurisprudence the most noted criminal lawyer in that part of the country he had always been a promoter of lawsuits and was very wealthy and had a large circle of influential acquaintances in granada and madrid when he had heard his worthy gossip's story and had carefully examined the paper he gave it as his opinion that the document had nothing whatever to do with the treasure that the hole in which the tube had been found was a sort of closet and the writing one of the prayers which the moors read every friday morning but notwithstanding this as he was not thoroughly versed in the arabic language he added that he would send the document to a college companion of his who was employed in the commission of the holy places in madrid in order that he might send it to jerusalem where it could be translated into spanish for which purpose it would be well to enclose to his friend in madrid a draft for a couple of ounces in gold for a cup of chocolate uncle juan gomez considered seriously before he made up his mind to pay so high a price for a cup of chocolate which would be paying for the article at a rate of ten thousand two hundred and forty reals a pound but he was so certain in regard to the treasure and in truth he was not mistaken as we shall see later on that he took from his belt eight gold pieces of four dollars each and delivered them to don matias who weighed them one by one before putting them into his purse after which hormiga took the road back to aldeir resolving in his own mind to continue his excavations under the moor's tower while the document went to the holy land and came back translated proceedings which according to the lawyer would occupy something like a year and a half uncle juan had no sooner turned his back upon his gossip and counsellor than the latter took his pen and wrote the following letter don bonifacio tudela y gonzales chapel master of the cathedral of ceuta my dear nephew-in-law to no one but a man of your piety would i confide the important secret contained in the accompanying document i say important because without a doubt in it are directions for finding the hiding place of a treasure of which i will give you a part if i should succeed in discovering it with your help to this end you must get a moor to translate the document for you and send me the translation in a certified letter mentioning the matter to no one unless it be your wife whom i know to be a person of discretion forgive my not having written to you in all these years but you know how busy a life i lead your aunt continues to remember you in her prayers every night i hope you are better of the affection of the stomach from which you were suffering in eighteen o six and remain your affectionate uncle-in-law matthias de quesada ujihar january fifteenth eighteen twenty one p s regards to peppa and tell me when you write if you have any children
having written this letter the distinguished jurist consult bent his steps towards the kitchen where his wife was engaged in knitting and minding the ola and throwing into her lap the four golden coins he had received from juan gomez he said to her in a harsh cross voice there encarnacion buy more wet it is going to rise in price during the dear months and see to it that you get good measure get my breakfast ready while i go post this letter for seville inquiring the price of barley let the egg be well done and don't let the chocolate be muddy as it usually is the lawyer's wife answered not a word but went on with her knitting like an automaton two weeks later on a beautiful day in january a day such as it is to be seen only in the north of africa and the south of europe the chapel master of the cathedral of ceuta was enjoying the sunshine on the roof of his two-story house with a tranquillity of mind proper to one who had played the organ at high mass and had afterward eaten a pound of anchovies another of meat and another of bread and drank the corresponding quantity of tarifa wine the worthy musician who was as fat as a hog and as red as a beet was slowly digesting his breakfast while his lethargic gaze slowly wandered over the magnificent panorama of the mediterranean the straits of gibraltar the accursed rock from which they take their name the neighbouring peaks of anghera and benzu and the distant snows of the lesser atlas when he heard hasty steps on the stairs and his wife's silvery voice crying joyfully bonifacio bonifacio a letter from your uncle and a heavy letter too well answered the chapel master turning round like a geographical sphere or globe on the point on which his rotund personality rested on the seat what saint can have put it into my uncle's head to remember me i have been living for fifteen years in this country usurped for mohammed and this is the first time that aben seraj has written to me although i have written to him a hundred times doubtless he wants me to render him some service so saying he opened the epistle contriving so that the pepa of the postscript should not be able to read its contents and the yellow parchment noisily unfolding itself greeted their eyes what has he sent us asked his wife a native of cadiz and a blonde attractive and fresh-looking notwithstanding her forty summers don't be inquisitive pepita i will tell you what is in the letter if i think you ought to know as soon as i have read it i have warned you a thousand times to respect my letters a proper precaution for a libertine like you at any rate be quick and let us see if i may know what that large paper is that your uncle has sent you it looks like a bank-note from the other world while his wife was making these and other observations the musician finished reading the letter whose contents surprised him so greatly that he rose to his feet without the slightest effort dissimulation was so habitual with him however that he was able to say in a natural tone of voice what nonsense the wretched man is no doubt already in his dotage would you believe that he sends me this leaf from a hebrew bible in order that i may look for some jew who will buy it the foolish creature supposing that he will get a fortune for it at the same time he added to change the conversation putting the letter and the parchment into his pocket at the same time he asks me with much interest if we have any children he has none himself cried pepita quickly no doubt he intends to leave us something it is more likely the miserly fellow thinks of our leaving him something but hark it is striking eleven it is time for me to go tune the organ for vespers i must go now listen my treasure let dinner be ready by one and don't forget to put a couple of good potatoes into the pot have we any children i am ashamed to tell him we have none see peppa said the musician after a moment having in mind no doubt the arabic document if my uncle should make me his heir or if i should ever grow rich by any other means i swear that i will take you to the plaza of san antonio in cadiz to live and i will buy you more jewels than our lady of sorrows of granada has so good-bye for a while my pigeon and pinching his wife's dimpled chin he took his hat and turned his steps not in the direction of the cathedral but in that of the poor quarter of the town in which the moorish citizens of ceuta for the most part lived in one of the narrow streets of this quarter seated on the floor or rather on his heels at the door of a very modest but very neat whitewashed house smoking a clay pipe was a moor of some thirty-five or forty years of age 
a dealer in eggs and chickens, which the free peasants of Sierra Bulones and Sierra Bermeja brought to him to the gates of Ceuta, and which he sold either in his own house or at the market with a profit of a hundred percent. He wore a white woolen chivala and a black woolen hooded Arab cloak, and was called by the Spaniards Manos Cordas, and by the Moors Admet Ben Karime El Abdun. When the Moor saw the chapel master approaching, he rose and advanced to meet him, making deep salams at every step, and when they were close together, he said cautiously, You want a little Moorish girl? I bring tomorrow a little dark girl of twelve. My wife wants no more Moorish servants, answered the musician stiffly. Manos Gordas began to laugh. Besides, continued Don Bonifacio, your infernal little Moorish girls are very dirty. Wash, responded the Moor, extending his arms crosswise and inclining his head to one side. I tell you I want no Moorish girls, said Don Bonifacio. What I want today is that you, who know so much that you are interpreter of the fortress, should translate this document into Spanish for me. Manos Gordas took the document and, at the first glance, murmured, It is more. Of course, it is in Arabic, but I want to know what it says, and if you do not deceive me, I will give you a handsome present when the business which I am about to entrust you with is concluded. Meantime, Admet Ben Karime glanced his eye over the document, turning very pale as he did so. You see that it concerns a great treasure, the chapel master half affirmed, half asked. Me think so, stammered the Mohammedan. What do you mean by saying you think so? Your very confusion tells plainly that it is so. Pardon, replied Manos Gordas, a cold sweat breaking out over his body. Here words modern Arabic I understand. Here words ancient or classic Arabic I no understand. What do the words that you understand signify? They signify gold, they signify pearls, they signify curse of Allah, but I no understand meaning, explanations, or signs. Must see the dervish of Angera, wise man, and translate all. I take parchment today, and bring parchment tomorrow, and deceive not, nor rob, senor Tudela. Moor swear. Saying which, he clasped his hands together, and raising them to his lips, kissed them fervently. Don Bonifacio reflected. He knew that in order to decipher the meaning of this document he should be obliged to take some more into his confidence, and there was none with whom he was so well acquainted, and who was so well disposed to him as Manos Gordas. He consented, therefore, to confide the manuscript to him, making him swear repeatedly that he would return on the following day from Anghera with a translation, and swearing to the Moor on his side that he would give him at least a hundred dollars when the treasure should be discovered. The Mussulman and the Christian then separated, and the latter directed his steps not to his own house, nor to the cathedral, but to the office of a friend of his, where he wrote the following letter. Senor Don Matias de Quesada y Sanchez Alpujara Ujihar, My dearest uncle, thanks be to God that we have at last received news of you and of Aunt Encarnacion, and as good news as Josefa and I could desire. We, my dear uncle, although younger than you and my aunt, are full of ailments and burdened with children who will soon be left orphans and compelled to beg for their bread. Whoever told you that the document you sent me bore any reference to a treasure deceived you. I have had it translated by a competent person, and it turns out to be a string of blasphemies against our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Virgin, and the saints, written in Arabic verses by a Moorish dog of the Marquisate of El Senet during the rebellion of Aben Humeya. In view of its sacrilegious nature, and by the advice of the senior penitentiary, I have just burned this impious testimony of Mohammedan perversity. Remembrances to my aunt, Josefa, desires to be remembered to you both. She is now for the tenth time in an interesting condition, and your nephew, who is reduced to skin and bone by the wretched affection of the stomach, which you will remember, begs that you will send him some assistance. Bonifacio. Ceuta, January 29th. 1821. While the chapel master was writing and posting this letter, Admet el Abdun was gathering together in a bundle all his wearing apparel and household belongings, consisting of three old hooded mantles, two cloaks of goat's wool, a mortar for grinding alcathuth, an iron lamp, 
and a copper skillet full of pesetas, which he dug up from a corner of the little yard of his house. He loaded with all this his one wife, slave, odalisque, or whatever she might be, a woman uglier than an unexpected piece of bad news, and filthier than her husband's conscience, and issued forth from Ceuta, telling the soldier on guard at the gate opening on the Moorish country, that they were going to fests for change of air by the advice of a veterinary. And as from that day, now more than sixty years ago, to this, no one in Ceuta or its neighborhood has ever again seen Manos Gortas. It is obvious that Don Bonifacio Tudela y Gonzalez had not the satisfaction of receiving from his hands the translation of the document, either on the following or on any other day during the remainder of his existence, which indeed cannot have been very long, since according to reliable information it appears that his adored Pepita took to herself after his death another husband, an Asturian drum major, residing in Marbella, whom she presented with four children, beautiful as the sun, and that she was again a widow at the time of the death of the king, at which epoch she gained, by competition in Malaga, the title of gossip and the position of matron in the custom house. And now let us follow Manos Gordas and learn what became of him and of the mysterious document. Admet Ben Karime El Abdun, breathed freely and even danced a few steps for joy without dancing off his ill-fastened slippers however as soon as he found himself outside the massive walls of the spanish fortress and with all africa before him for africa for a true african like manos gordas is the land of absolute liberty of a liberty anterior and superior to all human constitutions and institutions of a liberty resembling that enjoyed by the wild rabbits and other wild animals of the mountain the valley or the desert by this i mean to say that africa is the paradise of evil doers the safe asylum the neutral ground of both men and beasts protected here by the intense heat and the vast extent of the deserts as for the sultans kings and beys who fancy they rule here and the authorities and soldiers who represent them it may be said that they are for such subjects that the hunter is for the hare or for the stag a misadventure which one in a hundred may chance to meet with and which may or may not result fatally if he who meets it dies he is remembered on the anniversary of his death and if he does not die he takes himself off to a sufficient distance from the scene of his mishap and no more is thought about the matter with this digression we will now resume the thread of our story this way zama cried the moor to his weary consort as if he were calling to a beast of burden and instead of turning eastward that is to say toward the gap of anghera in quest of the holy sage in accordance with his promise to don bonifacio he proceeded southward along a ravine overgrown with wild brambles and forest trees which soon brought him to the tetuan road that is to say to the indistinct footpath which following the indentations of the coast leads to cape negro by the valley of the tarahar the valley of the castilejos mount negro and the lakes of asmir river names which are now heard by every true spaniard with love and veneration but which at the time of our story had not yet been pronounced either in spain or in any other part of the civilized world when ben karime and zama had reached the little valley of the tarahar they sat down to rest for a while at the edge of the rivulet which rising in the heights of sierra bolones runs through it and in this wild and secluded spot that seemed as if it had come fresh from the creator's hand and had never yet been trod by the foot of man looking out on the solitary ocean whose waters were untracked say on an occasional moonlight night by some pirate caravel or government vessel sent from europe in pursuit of it the moorish woman proceeded to make her toilet performing her ablutions in the stream and the moor unfolded the manuscript and read it again manifesting no less emotion than he had showed on the previous occasion the contents of the arabian manuscript were as follows may the benediction of allah rest on all good men who read these lines there is no glory but the glory of allah whose prophet and messenger mohammed was and is in the hearts of the faithful may those who rob the house of him who is at the wars or in exile be accursed of allah and of mohammed and die eaten up by beetles and cockroaches blessed be allah who created these and other vermin to devour the wicked 
I am the Kaid Hassan ben Yusef, the servant of Allah, although I am miscalled Don Rodrigo de Acuna by the successors of the Christian dogs who, by force and in violation of solemn compact, baptized with the broom of hyssop my ill-fated ancestors together with many other Islamites of these kingdoms. I am a captain serving under the banner of him whose lawful title, since the death of Aben Humaya, is king of Andalusia, Muley Abdallah Mahmoud Aben Abu, who does not now sit on the throne of Granada because of the treachery and cowardice with which the Moors of Valencia broke their oaths and compacts, failing to rise with the Moors of Granada against the common enemy. But they will receive their reward from Allah, and if we are conquered, they too will be conquered and in the end expelled from Spain, without the merit of having fought to the last on the field of honor in defense of their rights. And if we are the conquerors, we will cut off their heads and throw them to the swine. I am in conclusion the lord of this tower, and of all the land surrounding it, westward to the ravine of the fox, and eastward to the ravine of the asparagus, so called from the luxuriant growth and exquisite flavor of the asparagus cultivated there by my grandfather, Sidi Yusuf ben Yusuf. Things are going badly with us, since the coming of the base-born Don Juan of Austria, whom may Allah confound. To fight against the faithful, we have foreseen that, for the present, we shall be defeated, although in the course of years or of centuries another prince of the blood of the prophet may recover the throne of granada which for seven hundred years was in the possession of the moors and which will be theirs again when allah wills it by the same right by which it was formerly possessed by the goths and vandals and before that by the romans and before that by those other africans the carthaginians by the right of conquest but i know as i have said that for the present things are going badly with us and that i must very soon depart for morocco taking with me my forty-three sons that is to say unless the austrians capture me in the coming battle and hang me on a tree as i would hang all of them if it were in my power to do so well then when i depart from this tower to engage in the last and the decisive campaign I live hidden here, in a place which no one can discover without coming across this manuscript, all my gold, all my silver, all my pearls, my family treasures, the possessions of my fathers, of myself and of my heirs, the fortune of which I am lord and master by human and divine right, as the bird is of its feathers, or the child of the teeth he cuts with suffering, or as every mortal is of the bad humours, cancerous, leprous, which he may inherit from his ancestors stay thy hand stay thy hand then o thou more christian or jew who in tearing down this my dwelling mayest discover and read these lines which i am now writing stay thy hand and respect the treasure house of thy fellow mortal touch not his estate take not possession of that which belongs to another here there is none of the public wealth nothing belonging to the exchequer nothing belonging to the state the gold in the mine may belong of right to him who discovers it and a part of it to the king of the country but gold melted down and stamped money coin belongs to its owner and to no one but its owner rob me not therefore evil men rob not my descendants who will come on the day appointed to take possession of their inheritance and if thou shouldst without evil intent and by chance discover my treasure i counsel thee to make public proclamation calling on and notifying the circumstance to the heirs of hassan ben yusef for it is not just to keep that which has been found when it has a lawful owner if thou dost not this be accursed with the curse of allah and with my curse and mayest thou be struck dead by lightning and may each coin of my money and each pearl of my treasure become a scorpion in thy hands and may thy children die of leprosy may their fingers rot and drop off so that they may not have even the pleasure of scratching themselves and may the woman thou lovest love thy slave and betray thee for him and may thy eldest daughter leave thy house secretly with the jew and mayest thou be impaled upon a stake and suspended on high exposed to the public gaze until by the weight of thy body the stake pierce thy crown and thou fall parted asunder on the ground like a loathsome toad cut in twain by the hoe now thou knowest what i would have thee know and let all men know it and blessed be allah who is allah tower of zoraya in aldeir in elsenet 
on the fifteenth day of the month of Safar, of the year of the Hejira, 968, Hassan ben Yusef. Manus Gordas was profoundly impressed by a second reading of this document, not because of the moral maxims or the terrible curses it contained, for the rascal had lost his faith both in Allah and in Mohammed through his frequent intercourse with the Christians and the Jews of Tetuan and Ceuta, who naturally scoffed at the Koran, but because he believed that his face, his accent, and some other personal peculiarities of his forbade his going to Spain, where he would find himself exposed to certain death should any Christian man or woman discover him to be an enemy to the Virgin Mary. Besides, what aid, in the opinion of Manos Gordas, could a foreigner, a Mohammedan, a semi-barbarian, expect from the laws or the authorities of Spain in acquiring possession of the Tower of Zoraya for the purpose of making excavations there, or what protection in retaining possession of the treasure when he should have discovered it, or even of his life? There is no help for it, was the conclusion to which he came after much reflection. I must trust the secret to the renegade Ben Munuza. He is a Spaniard, and his companionship will protect me from danger in that country. But as there does not exist under the canopy of heaven a wickeder man than this same renegade, it will not be amiss to take some precautions. And as a result of his reflections, he took from his pocket writing materials, wrote a letter, and enclosed it in an envelope, which he sealed with a bit of moistened bread, and this done, he burst into a sardonic laugh. He then looked at his wife, who was still engaged in removing the filth of an entire year from her person, at the expense of the material and moral cleanliness of the poor rivulet, and having attracted her attention by a whistle, he deigned to address her in these terms. Sit down here beside me, fig face, and listen to what I am going to say. You can afterward finish washing yourself, and well you need it. And perhaps I may then think you worthy of something better than the daily drubbing by which I show my affection for you. But for the present, present face, leave off your grimaces and listen well to what I am going to tell you. The Moorish woman, who after her toilet looked younger and more artistic, though no less ugly than before, licked her lips like a cat, fixed the two carbuncles that served her for eyes on Manos Gordas, and said, showing her broad white teeth that bore no resemblance to those of a human being, Speak, my lord, your slave desires only to serve you. Manos Gordas continued, If in the future any misfortune should happen to me, or if I should suddenly disappear without taking leave of you, or if after taking leave of you you should hear nothing from me within six weeks' time, make your way back to Ceuta and put this letter in the post. Do you understand fully what I have said, monkey face? Zama burst into tears and exclaimed, Admit, do you intend to abandon me? Don't be an ass, woman, answered the Moor. Who is talking of such thing now? you know very well that you please me and that you are useful to me the question now is whether you have understood my charge perfectly give it here said the moorish woman taking the letter and placing it in her dark-skinned bosom next her heart if any evil should happen to you this letter shall be placed in the post at ceuta though i should drop dead the moment after aben karime smiled with a human smile when he heard these words and deigned to let his eyes rest upon his wife as if she were a human being End of chapter five